afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to see everyone here. I've encountered most of you once or twice uh, through uh, Michael Goodart's class, but welcome to everyone else. Um, as you know, today's discussion is on the right to food, and our panel is sponsored by the University of Pittsburgh Global Studies Center, the Pittsburgh Food Policy Council, all of this in cooperation with the Pittsburgh Human Rights City Alliance. Uh, we'd like to offer a special thanks to Roger Rouse, who could not be here today, for his help in organizing the event. We have three uh, very exciting, dynamic, experienced speakers to offer you today. The first, uh, locally, is Dawn Plummer, who will give her comments first. She is the director of the Pittsburgh Food Policy Council. The second is Jessica Powers. Jessica, could you say hello? Hi, everybody. There you go. Thank you very much. Um, she is the director of Why Hunger's Nourish Network for the Right to Food. We also have Salo Araujo, who's the director of Why Hunger's Global Movements Program. Um, Michael Goodart prepared some comments to introduce each of these speakers that I'll be delivering now as everyone else gets settled. <clears throat> so first, uh, Don Plummer joined the Pittsburgh Food Policy Council in early June as its first director. Over the past 15 years, Don has served in a variety of leadership roles, including coordinator of national and international networks, coalition builder, fundraiser, researcher, and community organizer. Most recently, Don served for over six years as the development director of the Poverty Initiative, a New York City-based organization with a mission to raise up generations of religious and community leaders dedicated to building a, mov a movement to end poverty. Dawn received her MA in political science from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and her BA in urban studies from the University of Pennsylvania. Dawn has worked alongside grassroots community efforts and social movements in the US and globally who work to construct local food systems. Dawn served as the first staff person for Friends of the MST, Brazilian Landless Workers Movement. To our remote guests, um, starting uh, with Salo Arojo, he works to advance initiatives of food sovereignty and agroecology by identifying resources and network opportunities that will strengthen the work of grassroots organizations and social movements. Originally from Brazil, Salo brings years of experience working with urban and rural families in the United States and abroad. Prior to working with Why Hunger, he worked as the Latin America Program Coordinator for Grassroots International and served as consultant to international funders, including the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. He has a Bachelor's of Science degree in Agricultural Engineering from the Federal Rural University of Pernambuco State, Brazil, and an MA in International Development and Social Change from Clark University. Salo is a Senior Fellow of the Environmental Leadership Program and has served as board member and advisor for many organizations, including the Food Project, New England Grassroots Environmental Fund, and Justice at Work. Last but not least, my friends, we have Jessica Powers. She is responsible for leading a team of advocates on the Why Hunger Hotline and developing capacity building resources for emergency food providers through the Clearinghouse. Prior to joining Why Hunger, Jess managed an emergency feeding program that planned and responded to disasters affecting people in New York City and the Lower Hudson Valley for the American Red Cross in Greater New York. She responded to nationally declared disasters in New York, Iowa, and Louisiana, and most recently managed a kitchen site in response to the Alabama tornadoes. She worked as a food service professional for over 10 years. She was a chef and pastry chef at restaurants in New York City, managed teams for large event caterers, cooked on several yachts, and consulted at a former state bakery in Russia. Jess holds a BA in English Literature with honors from the University of California at Berkeley. Can you please give all three of our guests a warm welcome? Over to Don Plummer. Hi, everyone. Can they hear me on the screen, too, when I'm talking? I need to be holding the microphone. Mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to hold the microphone. 
get close to work whenever I look at my papers. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all for coming today. I'm very excited about this uh, conversation. Um, these obviously are um, issues that are very important uh, to each of us, as we know how many of us eat food every day. Very, very important um, issue, and we know that many are not able to do that, and so even more important that we understand the root causes of that situation. So this conversation today is very important. Um, as he mentioned, my name is Dawn Plummer. I'm with the Pittsburgh Food Policy Council. Um, and we are um, commemorating Food Day on Saturday. Um, today is what, Thursday on Saturday this week. Um, food Day is a national uh, day of understanding and, and changing the American diet and, and promoting real food, particularly promoting policies that promote real food. So that's part of why we're together today. Um, my role is to kick us off by looking very locally. Obviously, food systems questions and challenges are very, very complex, and they include local um, considerations, national and global, um, some of which we'll get into today, but my focus is on the local. Um, when we talk about food here in our region, most, mostly what I've found in the Food Policy Council, the phrase that's used is food access. Um, so when we're talking about food access, um, where where does food where is food available where is it not available um, and then what kind of food do we have access to um, and how does that food impact our health impact of the economic development of our communities our environment um, and our economy um, <clears throat> so here in Pittsburgh um, let's see here in Pittsburgh, um, as we've heard of, I've heard several times recently from the Secretary of Agriculture for the Pennsylvania uh, State Department of Agriculture, he said on multiple occasions that food is a basic right. Um, and so this is very interesting to me to hear a state level official using the language of rights. Um, uh, when we talk about food access, we're referring both uh, to uh, when we're talking about lack of access, we're talking about abil ability to financially access food as well as physically access food. Um, and we, we know a lot of things about the challenges of our region and I'll get into some of those now. So as we know, Pittsburgh has suffered a great, peri a great period of deindustrialization our, our, you know, with the decline of the steel industry in the late 70s and early 80s, leading to depopulation and impoverishment and unemployment. Um, in the last decade, uh, more recently, we've seen food insecurity intensify with the Great Recession of 2008, which brought high levels, again, of unemployment and continued wage stagnation, um, which is a lot in the conversation here in Pittsburgh and nationally. Um, which, which has contributed to the rise in hunger. Um, today in Allegheny County, which is the county in which uh, Pittsburgh is located, one in seven residents are considered food insecure. Uh, and we know that SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, uh, the, the uh, federal food program, otherwise known as the uh, food stamp program, is one of the most critical tools for poverty alleviation. And in Allegheny County, between the years of 2007 and 2013, people receiving um, SNAP benefits uh, increased significantly uh, by 44% over that six-year period. So that means that a significant number of our neighbors were relying more and more on SNAP for food. Uh, we also know that the, um, the use of our uh, emergency food network, um, food pantries, et cetera, have shifted from an emergency, you know, a place you go in emergency to actually becoming a more regular monthly a uh, place where uh, families and individuals will end up when they have an end of the month shortfall in their food, in their cabinets. Um, um, just to quickly show, this is a, a piece pulled together by the uh, Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank on hunger in Pittsburgh uh, that was shared with Mayor Peduto when he was new into office that shares some statistics on, and I'm not going to get into these, I can, you can find this report, I can share this uh, later. Um, Let's see, regions are sharing their screen. Let me hide that, okay. Um, but just to show, you know, the percentages of children in poverty, seniors in poverty, and families in poverty are significant in our region. Um, and there's also the question of, um, 
uh, working families in poverty. I think um, to, to you know we're, we definitely need to bust the myth, and I think at this point everyone's aware with the increasing conversations in income and wealth inequality in our country that we do have a situation where families who are accessing um, food assistance or emergency food doesn't mean that they're you know uh, lazy, crazy, or you know unemployed. It means that they are. Uh, in many cases, employed and simply not able to purchase food um, with with the salaries that they earn. And to that point, I wanted to raise the the question here, um, coming out of a recent uh, study called "The High Cost of Low Wages." In Pennsylvania, 51% um, of all of the federal federal public assistance uh, programs uh, received by families here actually. Uh, are received by working families. So by working family, we mean some, at least one member of the family works 27 hours or more per week or 10 or more hours, or per, 27 or more weeks per year or 10 or more hours per week. And this just gives you another snapshot. Um, again, I won't get into it greatly, but shows that at the national level, um, those families receiving SNAP are 36% uh, of them are working families. Um, so shifting now to the physical access to food um, and talking about food deserts. I don't know if, if any of you have heard about food deserts in Pittsburgh. Have you heard about our situation with food deserts? We actually have a very um, significant statistical ranking in our, uh, at the national level um, that you should be aware of. This is a, a 2010 map of food deserts um, collected uh, by uh, USDA data. And a food desert, um, if you're not familiar with the term, is an area that has 20 or percent more people living below the poverty line that simultaneously uh, live more than one mile from a grocery store um, where you can access food, let alone fresh food, um, which is a big focus of the Food Policy Council, fresh and healthy food. Um, so to compound this problem in our region, we know that it's, you know, um, if you try to walk or bike or drive anywhere, you're going up and over and around. And so even if you live a mile from a grocery store, that might be straight uphill, um, which if you have any, um, if you don't have transportation or there isn't an accessible public transportation route um, or you have a physical um, limitation, you're obviously um, deeply impacted by this status of a food desert. I apologize for all the words on this, but when I say that Pittsburgh stands out nationally, uh, Pittsburgh is the, has the largest percentage of people residing in communities with low uh, supermarket access. Um, and nearly half of Pittsburghers uh, live in what we call a food desert. Um, and that makes Pittsburgh, for a city of its size, uh, number two for the number impacted by this low access. So if um, we're looking at cities uh, between, I think it's 250 and uh, uh, 500,000 that that ranks Pittsburgh significantly, uh, which is something that we we need to get to work and are getting to work on here. Uh, let's see. Okay, and the campus here is certainly not immune to issues of hunger um, and food access struggles. Um, the pit pantry opened. I don't know if it was last spring, um, but you now have a food pantry on campus that I know I would have been appreciative of at my undergraduate university, and please share this with your friends. Um, they're also a member of the Food Policy Council. Um, so that gets into, that's a little bit of the perspective here locally um, of some of our food challenges. Obviously, our food system is complex. There's a lot of challenges that I'll get briefly into some more of those, um, but that was an overview. Um, so now I wanna get a little bit into what our region is doing to promote the right to food. So the Pittsburgh Food Policy Council works, as this slide says, works to build a food system that benefits our communities, economy, and environment in ways that are just, equitable, and sustainable. As I mentioned before, food systems are very complex, and, and that's the beauty of a food policy council is that you get to look at the complexity of these challenges all the way from um, food production, who has access to land, what materials do we use to produce, how does that impact the land in our region and our water and our air, et cetera all the way through distribution. Do we have the channels to get fresh food from our region into the city and consumption and even waste? We know that nearly 40% of food in this country goes to waste. And that's uh, at the same time as we have these high numbers of hunger, et cetera. So there's some work to be done. Um, so what we do at the Food Policy Council is we connect stakeholders. Um, 
bringing together both government, uh, nonprofit, for-profit community organizations, farmers, universities, anti-hunger advocates, health professionals, and more. Um, and we come together to think outside of the individual mission of our organization, to think together about some solutions we can bring in partnership. So we coordinate efforts um, across our food system and ideally we catalyze change. So this is not only about identifying problems and creating quick solutions, but also digging into some of the root causes and coming up with some policy solutions that can get to some of those um, deeper issues. So this is a, a visual representation of our membership. We have, um, as I mentioned, a cross-sectoral um, membership um, who come together uh, as the Food Policy Council. So we have 65 entities and 130 individuals who are involved in our council. Um, and I, I believe we have three more who just joined. Um, so as I said before, one of the beauties of coming together is we can share what our understanding of our broken food system is, um, because what might affect someone on one end and they may not realize how that impacts farmers. For example, we know that um, you know we have food access and hunger issues in, in urban centers, but do we also know that farmers really are hardly making it themselves? And so what does this mean for our food system if we can't actually sustain food production to make the food that we all need? Um, so, you know, the things we talk about are the fact that our farming, uh, our farmers are aging. The average age of a farmer is something like 52 years old, or maybe it's higher than that. Um, so they're looking towards retirement, um, and we need a new, ge new generation of farmers. Um, you know, a difficulty with accessing land. Um, obviously, it's a capital intensive thing. If you go into farming, you need to have some cash uh, to do that. We, we talked about poverty and low wages. We talked about rising food costs, food waste. Transportation, we know our health uh, of our soil due to, you know, um, our agricultural practices. We need to be feeding our soil more than we are in this country. Um, and we have a farm labor shortage. Many of the farmers of our region say that they don't have, they simply don't have the labor to, um, to uh, produce uh, in the way that they would like to have. Um, so those are some of the questions. And also our poor health. So we also have high rates of diabetes, obesity, and heart disease in our region. Um, we are working closely with the health department on some of these things, so that's another interesting um, partnership. The way that we go at our work is we organize ourselves into three large kind of topical groups. One is food access and health. Uh, the second is urban agriculture, which includes immigrant and refugee food and farm access working group, uh, where we talk about how some of the new uh, newer populations to Pittsburgh who have agricultural backgrounds and want to go into farming, don't have access to their traditional foods, et cetera, how there might be some opportunity there. Um, then in our regional food economy working group, we look a lot about how our um, Look at how our institutions, like here at Pitt, you, you have the real food challenge. You do have a commitment to um, purchasing uh, food that, that has some uh, standards around um, humane treatment of animals, local production, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we look at those questions and how our, reg our regional institutions can actually um, impact the economy um, and food system um, in a significant way if we can move the dial on local procurement. Um, and other things we talk about there as well. Um, so in, in thinking through, you know, how does, oh, I'll, I'll just share quickly back on the um, food access and health policies. Um, there's a variety of things that are underway and I, there's many, many things that are happening and hopefully you've heard of some of these. We have a great uh, farmer's market network where one of the, it's, it's not super common that farmer's markets are supported by city parks here in Pittsburgh. Our city parks department runs, I think 14, farmers markets, many or most of which we are able to accept credit cards or um, EBT cards and debit cards, which is very helpful to everyone involved. We also have a food bucks uh, coupon um, program where if you, you are low income, you can get a, re, um, a coupon that will, I think it's you get um, for every $5 spent, you get two extra dollars to spend in the farmers market, which impacts both the farmer and obviously the the purchaser of, of that fresh, healthy local food. Um, we have grocery stores and, and conversations about bringing grocery stores into, into neighborhoods that, that have lacked them for a significant amount of time. We have a healthy corner stores initiative working with corner store owners that traditionally sell things like cigarettes and lottery tickets and trying to move to a healthy product mix that would, that would bring some fresh food and healthy food into neighborhoods again that, that greatly need it. 
We have mobile food markets. Um, we have, um, as I mentioned, a, an extensive food pantry emergency food network. Uh, we have, you know, government and nonprofit programs for children, whether they're eating in school. Um, the Pittsburgh uh, School District is um, at the whole, I forget how you say this, but like the community eligibility, uh, they, because of the percentage of low income students, um, the, the you no longer have to apply one family at a time to get uh, lunch for your student for your child. The whole school is automatically um, in that program, which is is a new uh, development here. Uh, we have backpack programs. Um, we're bringing fresh food to, to child care centers who otherwise would use um, shelf stable food. Um, edible schoolyard programs, cooking clubs for high schoolers, school wellness committees, and a whole kind of a whole range of things. Trying to move. Um, a sea change in, in both eating and, and producing food. Um, just this last slide, and I'll wrap up here, is how to implement the right to food, just sort of broadly stepping back from all of those details of what we do in the Food Policy Council. This is what I was um, um, kind of resonated in my mind as uh, promoting the right to food in our region. We want to promote the growing of food, the growing of food democracy. We see the um, Food Policy Council as an important place to grow food democracy, to have a place for everyone to have a voice in the uh, in what in designing and creating policy um, around food, growing farmers and agroecologically sustainable farms, growing access to land, um, growing food systems analysis so we understand what our challenges are and share an analysis and and therefore can formulate solutions, grow our food knowledge, grow good food jobs. We know that uh, a lot of uh, the food insecurity rate among food sector workers is actually higher than other. Uh, workers, so that's an important um, nugget to dig into and what, what's going on there. Um, and grow connections to other basic rights. I think that's one of the main takeaways from me and my work uh, with human rights is that we don't you know, wake up in the morning and think, I'm a human being and today I need food, and tomorrow I need housing, and the next day I need an education, and the next day I need good wages. Actually, you need all of these things every single day, and they should be mutually supporting one another. And I think that in our sort of, um, in our country, we've really moved into a direction of individualization of problems um, generally. And so human rights helps us move away from a blaming the victim kind of uh, mentality and looking more at the um, broader, more structural uh, causes of some of the inequities that we see. Um, growing food and farm leaders um, is part of that. We need to not only just put out our opinion, but you know, be leaders in this work around food and grow food policy. And this last slide, it's just October 24th is food day. And the way that we're commemorating is both by sharing a calendar of events that I can share later with you. Um, we're also convening a youth strategic dialogue on food and talking to young people around the city of Pittsburgh about how food impacts them in their school environment, home environment, and communities to have a youth leadership voice in our food policy formation because we know that that's very critical. So I'll leave it at that. I'm sorry if I was long-winded. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Don. Our next speaker will be Jessica Powers. Again, she's the director of Why Hunger's Nourish Network for the Right to Food. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me? Um, I just want to make sure that I'm actually sharing my slides. Let's see. Nope. Here we go. Jess, could you say hello again? I don't think the screen was Hi, this is Jess. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We sure can. We're just trying to. Oops, sorry, Jess, I turned him off. Oh, that's okay. Can you. you can hear me now? All right. Yep. Can you, you see can my slides? Share slide? your slides when you're ready. All right. Let's see. Um, this. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yep, they're coming through. Okay. All right. So let me make that bigger. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Technology. Okay. 
How's that? That's good, Jess. Is that good? Okay, great. All right. So, hi, everyone. Um, so, before I discuss the rates of food in the U.S., I'm going to start with some statistics, a little background about hunger in this country. There are, Don was talking about locally, so I'm, I'm bringing it up to the national level. So, there are 49 million people who are food insecure in the U.S. So, that's one in seven people. And this image shows the distribution of that around the country. More than half of food insecure people live in rural areas. 22% live in urban areas and 24% in suburban communities. And over 90% of the highly uh, food insecure rate counties are in the South. The U.S. Department of Agriculture developed the US, what's called the U.S. Household Food Security Survey Module to measure food insecurity. It's a series of questions used to determine whether or not a household has sufficient access to nutritious food. So for example, I couldn't afford to eat balanced meals. Was this true often, sometimes, or never for your household in the last 12 months? Or another question on the survey is, in the last 12 months, were you or your child ever hungry, but you just couldn't afford more food? So. Since food insecurity is so tied to health, both poor health and the ability to manage chronic conditions, now the Affordable Care Act mandates that all federally funded clinics and hospitals screen for hunger um, by asking the two questions that you see here on the slide. So I'm using that as an example just to show the types of questions that are asked in order to determine whether or not someone is hungry. Um, obviously, hunger presents itself differently in the U.S. Um, from other countries around the world. Slides. The slides change. Oh, um, as did you as you continue. Huh? You, you're not seeing me switch back and forth. We no. See, we see the okay. title slide. Oh wow. Okay. What go. if I do this? Okay. That's working that great. Okay Thank you so much. If it's not in in a slides to show view, it doesn't matter, I guess. Okay. So. Then I went to this slide. <laughs> um, but the different measures of poverty that are used by the government are, are sorely outdated. Today, most people who are poor are working, as Don mentioned, um, but they have to make difficult choices between buying food and paying for utilities or paying for transportation or medicine or housing. Um, in fact, four out of five Americans will experience poverty at some point in their lifetime. So most Americans associate private charity, religious institutions, food banks, or food pantries with providing resources for people who are hungry. It's somewhat misleading because government, as the show indicate, slide indicates, um, provides the vast majority of food assistance in the form of SNAP or food stamps, school meals, the WIC program, et cetera. But again, those resources are insufficient. So I don't want to downplay the importance or, or the tremendous efforts that are made by food banks and food pantries to try to help people cobble together enough food resources. Uh, but the problem is, as, as my colleague Eric Talkin at the Food Bank of um, Santa Barbara says, that food banks have become the de facto grocery stores for an increasingly poverty-ridden society. So instead of money, you pay for your food with your time by standing in line. So this becomes a justice issue, um, and using a human rights framework seeks to address some of those issues. It holds government accountable, it affirms that food is a right shared by all people, and it calls on all of us to organize. The majority of people receiving government assistance are, are white and working poor, families with children, with seniors, or with disabled people. But the myth of the welfare queen persists, and it targets urban people of color. It assumes that people are poor because of bad choices or, or a personal failure, and it assumes that we can judge them. Rather than the systemic issues that disinvest in communities, that consolidate control of wealth, resources, and power, and create wider inequality. So a human rights approach in the U.S. must necessarily ah, sorry, um, include racial and economic justice. 
to address the structural causes of poverty and hunger. It must call for an integrated and coordinated approach to food and agriculture. One of the criticisms of the human rights approach in the U.S. is that it's too focused on the role of government. Some people prefer terms like community food security, which is on this slide, defined on this slide, um, or food justice, which is defined on this slide. La Via Campesina argued that the term food sovereignty, in which people have the right to determine what their own food system looks like, speaks more to self-determination or what Don was referring to as food democracy. So I would argue that all of these terms are important. Government needs to be held accountable by social movements. The right to food is also ultimately a call to action that asserts that government has a responsibility to respect, protect, and fulfill rights. And while much is written about the policies that government can put in place, equally important is the role of social movements. As we see today with Black Lives Matter and the Fight for 15, people must demand change and be vigilant. So some communities are using the right to food as a tool in discussions about changing the local food system and it addressing hunger and poverty. So for example, Poughkeepsie Plenty created these comic strips based on the experiences of low income people in their community. And then community give, members are, are given a series of questions to discuss, uh, including how is the right to food being fulfilled or not fulfilled in these instances. And through this, they um, try to create some action items that, that the community can work on together. So with the mainstream anti-hunger organizations I've spoken with, the human rights framework seems to resonate, but this is probably because the charitable approach to hunger hasn't solved the problem. People recognize that government policies are contributing to rising income inequality, and that must be changed. And again, social movements are needed to demand those changes. And that's it for me. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Jessica. Sure. Uh, last, we have Salo Araujo, uh, who is the director of Why Hunger's Global Movements Program. Just one second here. And Salo, you can share your screen whenever you're ready. It'll just take over Jess's. We see you, Solo, and I think we're ready. There we go. We see your slides, too. Wonderful. Sure. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, thanks so much for inviting us to, to speak at, uh, at this webinar. Uh, uh, first of all, I, 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 I personally cannot say no to Don, Don Plummer, um, a longtime friend and someone that I respect. Um, for high commitment for these issues of uh, poverty and, and hunger. Um, and also because uh, I have family in Pittsburgh, so I cannot say no to the University of Pittsburgh to participate in this conversation. Um, so I, my, my piece now that uh, actually is be quite easier after Don and, and Jess has uh, made such a great presentations on the right to food, I will present some of the elements, some questions uh, for us to think about um, as we try, as we 
go over to questions and reflections on this uh, issue of the right to food. I will be presenting more on the uh, global context of the right to food. So uh, I think first we need to to discuss who is hung, who is the hungry and malnourished and and who is impacted by our current food system. Um, and that's why I think the conversation on the right to food emerge. This is not um, an intellectual exercise. Is the uh, a real issue uh, defined by by our food system basically? Um, so uh, according to the UN, we have. Um, 795 million uh, people uh, who, are, who are hungry, uh, food insecure. This estimate is a very conservative estimate because um, uh, it doesn't include uh, actually people who have, um, who occasionally uh, needs to source food and procure food in food banks and food, and food pantries. Um, um, and uh, but uh, one thing that we should know is that 70% of that total are, are rural families um, and uh, people who actually have to migrate uh, from from the land, ancestral land, um, to find a better job, better living condition in other place. So those rural families are actually food producers. Um, who have been feeding not only themselves but also the, the community. And in many countries, um, we have estimates of uh, from 60 to 70 percent of the food that people are consuming in, in different countries are actually produced by small uh, scale uh, food producers, fisher folk, pastoralists, women, uh, peasants, farmers. Uh, but those folks have been actually pushed out, out of the, uh, the ancestral land um, and the economic policies, the new liberal policies, the free trade agreements have made everything impossible for actually to be, continue being producing food and feed themselves. So here's the, the first contradiction that I think we should uh, raise. Uh, who, is the, who is the hungry? Um, and actually, as uh, uh, um, Jess pointed out, um, most of the folks in our home, in our country, uh, who actually depend on food banks, are people who are working, have at least uh, one person in the family who earn a living wage, or supposed to be a living wage. Um, so those folks cannot pay the transportation, the cell phone bill, uh, the rent mostly, uh, and also buy food. And that's that's the one thing that we think we should point out to understand why we are talking about right to food. So it's, uh, it's certainly we live in a food system that uh, is working. It's working better for a few people, um, mostly people who have investments in, in, in corporations um, who are controlling a large percentage of the both seed production processing and retail of food. So um, the food system, yes, so the food system is benefiting a few people, but also is causing the, the hunger that we see. Uh, some people call even the policies of hunger instead of food policies, right? Um, that actually is putting people, not creating only hunger, but a dependency um, and diminishing the dignity for, for, uh, for a better life. So people who actually cannot feed themselves and feed their families um, are in a much difficult situation uh, of thinking, responding, participating uh, in, in society. Um, so um, this is just a picture to show the, um, uh, the World Food Program for the UN, who is distributing food, who actually, um, we have to say that uh, um, any food that are rich, the, uh, the table of families, I think we should we should be appreciative. The problem is that those programs are, have no end and they have no replacement uh, for those type of programs. And I think one one thing that we have learned is that um, uh, for us to uh, 
to end hunger, we need to address the issues of uh, democratic control of resources. Um, and, and, then, and then we have to raise the question, why do you end up like this? I think that's something that we should reflect in terms of uh, as we talk about the right to food. Why are the issues, the root, root causes us as a society has allowed this to happen? That uh, human beings have not access to, to food, the, the basic uh, energy intake that for them to actually perform and be uh, and enjoy themselves as a, as a human beings. So one, some of the issues, yes, we give up a lot of control over our food system uh, to fuel corporations because food is, um, is an essential basic need and, and, and that's why it makes that more, even more profitable because we cannot end up, we, we cannot not eat every day, right? <clears throat> so we, we, in that way, in that sense, we give up a lot of power. <clears throat> And we need to find a way to reclaim that back. Uh, also, we um, we have devalued the work and the knowledge of our farmers, fisher folk families. Uh, the modernity through um, the green revolution um, has pushed has. Uh, has uh, has pushed farmers outside out of the the the, the land, but uh, before that, the um, academia, governments, our food policies have um, a media, the common the uh, the media communications uh, outlet has expressed past the idea that uh, the knowledge of our, the food producers are. Are backwards and are not valid to actually produce food. That are the best way to produce food would be larger machines, monocrops, uh, pesticides, and, and mostly when we talk about growing food, we have depend on people uh, with some training, some academic training. So I think that's another issue of why why we we create that uh, we get into this point. But that, that is that are there are other issues that we could relate, and I, I bet some of you, many of you, have ideas about that. Why why did you end up like this? So, but uh, people are developing uh, different uh, strategies, programs. Um, initiatives with uh, very similar goals, uh, both in the US and outside of the US. One of them is food sovereignty. Communes and nations are, are trying to regain control over what's produced and what's consumed. Because basically the Doritos, the, the, the tacos that we eating here in the US are the same, made up the same a similar variety of, people, of corn produced in Argentina, in Brazil, and other places. So that is a simplification of our of our, what we consume, and not only that, the, the genetic diversity, the agrobiodiversity that are um, the basis for the producing that food, and that include the the spread of the use of uh, genetic modified uh, organisms, GMO seeds, um, and and also the same chemicals that we are being poisoning our food. Independently, if we are a vegetarian, vegan, or, uh, or people like me who comes from Brazil and loves meat, um, we are in the same way being affected by this. So reclaim our food sovereignty, it's, it's necessary. Of course, there is a, a number of issues that are uh, and challenges for the, to accomplish that. First uh, and foremost is the uh, is the free trade agreements uh, that are uh, preventing us to achieve our food sovereignty and the right to food. Uh, the other front is also the agroecology. Uh, as um, Don pointed out, um, the issue is that agroecology is, is actually like an uh, action plan to achieve food sovereignty and also to replace the industrial agriculture model. Uh, and we need agroecology 
which is based on the knowledge of food producers, women, men, young people who actually are producing the food. So the base, the base of knowledge is uh, coming from those who are actually producing food, actually uh, uh, building our schools, actually uh, um, uh, producing the every single uh, uh, good that we have before, before us. So valuing the knowledge of those who are producing our food is, will be a major step for us to change that. And, and, and the other front is the, the right to food. The right to food is a legal framework. Um, it's just a vehicle to us to achieve the human right to food. It's not the only one, we, it's not the single one, but it's a, a, a new front for us to push governments um, and contain the, uh, the increasing power of corporations. Um, just to show you um, um, I, um, a picture here on, on the right to food. If you see that uh, the map, I hope you can see the map. Uh, very few countries have not all passed uh, amending the constitutions uh, to explicitly say that the right to food is a human a human right. Salo, uh, pardon me. We, we don't we don't see the map, sir. Sorry to interrupt. Just letting you know. You cannot see, right? So We've seen all the slides, but no map. No map. All right, that's fine. So the, um, what we have is that uh, um, 42 countries has passed, uh, um, has amended constitutions to explicitly, explicitly say uh, on the, uh, the right to food is a, a human right. Uh, others will even go even beyond to express the food sovereignty. Uh, it's a right, and it should be a complete should be achieved by the by the state. And uh, others are participating in international treaties to to enforce the right to food. All have in it's not so explicit. It has not an explicit language in the constitution, but it has this implicit language of of, of human rights. But there are few countries. Um, about seven that I want to mention here. One is Malaysia, who have no, not any single um, mention on the right to food. Uh, Burma, uh, South Sudan, uh, Botswana, uh, Western Sahara, and the United States of America. Um, so those are the countries who have not any anything related to right to food all are participating in, in signing international treaties to enforce the right to food. So uh, that's what we, uh, where we are at. Um, uh, so those are, those are just the fronts that we are, um, people are working to implement the right to food, to push for food justice, food sovereignty, um, agriculture and the right to food. But uh, who is behind those actions? Who, who is doing that? Who is actually uh, uh, make us to uh, honor the right to food? Um, so there are women, uh, young people, families in general, uh, rural and urban, uh, peasants, uh, fisher folk, uh, unions, academics, uh, churches, students, um, it's a very broad coalition in different countries, and there are different expressions on on those uh, uh, on how those all different sectors come in, coming together. Uh, they are inspired by and organized by local councils, um, such as the the, the Pittsburgh Food uh, Food Council uh, networks and social movements. And, and social movements, we are talking about uh, organized uh, um, structures led by uh, by those affected by, uh, by by the policies, or uh, peasants, or women, or uh, homeless people, um, young people. So those are social movements which are mass popular bodies who are pushing. Uh, those uh, those processes, and we need more that we need to uh, build uh, 
those larger uh, broad fronts um, of uh, uh, that actually can create the capacity for us to change our food system that are one that can be more just and for everyone. Uh, uh, and, 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 and justice in general, not only the right to food, but the right to house, housing and, and so on. Uh, the way forward that we are learning with social movements is that we have to build a global solidarity, but a solidarity as a two-way street, not only as a shared, a, a, a shared, a shared um, initiative that we are just pay our solidarity to some different community or, or different country uh, or indigenous people. But uh, to build solidarity, the, for the, it's important also for us to understand that, uh, that we have common issues, common enemies, common problems to address. So that's how we, are, how we build uh, solidarity. Um, as I said, I, we, we have to get out of our silos, our um, limited uh, views um, on, on what and who we should, should talk to. We have to create a unity and diversity of ideas. Um, and, and that is called also to build international solidarity. Um, people in the US cannot change the food system by themselves, neither people from Brazil. But we have to change this together because the forces are global. The, the root causes of all those all those things are, are global. Uh, we 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 should continue organize conversations about how to regain our food our food sovereignty in our community. We should defend the inclusion of the right to food language in city laws, state, and national constitutions. Uh, Pittsburgh is very well known by its progressive laws, um, progressive thinking. So probably you have more allies than in, in other countries <laughs> in, the, in the government and, and among city officials. Um, and we have to, to commit to, to, to the right to food, uh, like it's everyone's business, right? It's not only a specific a business for um, of those who are actually need to go uh, to a food bank right now, those who have been expelled from the land. Uh, but it's it's everybody's business. It's everybody uh, because it impacts everyone. Uh, the right to food is not limited only to um, to access food, but uh, what the food system that we want. Um, and with that, um, Don, Jess, um, I will stop here and I would love to, to hear questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Salo, Jessica, Don. I believe we do have some time uh, for questions and comments. Um, I thought perhaps if we can get rid of your PowerPoint, uh, Salo, I don't know if we can get rid of that. Wait, oh, oh, we're doing so well. There we go. Great. So the way it should work is I will help people get a microphone to offer their questions. And Don, if you can just go ahead and take the podium. So the uh, microphone is not so much for us, everyone, but it's so that our remote guests can hear uh, what you have to say. So we'll have to share a microphone and pass things around. Um, do we have anyone who would like to start? Thanks. Um, so this is a Pittsburgh regional question. And my question is, well, I understand that there's a lot of initiatives going on to um, bring food access, especially to low income areas like Hazelwood and Homewood. Um, but what efforts are being done so that the residents know what are going on in their neighborhood and how they can get to this food? Because I, I know that in the Homewood neighborhood, 
their closest grocery store is in East Liberty. And then they have the East End Food Co-op and Point Breeze, Co-op and Point Breeze, but I'm not quite sure how they're getting all the information and how they're able to use their SNAP benefits and things like that. So I have a couple of answers to that. First, I would say, I know I was just the other day behind a bus and saw the fresh access program so that you can use your, your SNAP benefits at farmer's markets. I know there's a lot of outreach in terms of um, flyers and social media and things like that to share that kind of information. Um, I also know there are, um, and in the Food Policy Council, we're very much um, uh, interested in and have been building relationships with community-based organizations, mostly through um, community-based organizations and CDC's community development um, organizations. There's certainly more to be done in churches and other um, organizations as well, but I think in, we're seeing in Pittsburgh, community by community, there are, are various um, solutions that can be brought to bear for, for a food desert situation. So for example, in Homewood, the, um, the Bible Center has an, uh, what are they calling it? An eco, a food, what are they calling it? A, they're building a food ecosystem, the food, um, sorry, it's called the Oasis Project. Um, and they're in the process of, I think in collaboration with with a lot of partners, Grow Pittsburgh and community members, obviously, and CMU, they have their their um, their they have a whole variety of things they're doing, putting in a cafe, a, a, a restaurant, um, a greenhouse, a community garden, and trying to you know connect those things. So the food, and this is happening in a variety of communities around Pittsburgh, where you have a community garden or an urban farm that is um, growing food to sell in that, in that community. And part of some of the change that we've been able to um, do coming together as a food policy council is change our urban ag zoning code. So people who wanna grow food, have chickens and bees in their yard, um, they can now do so in more areas of the city. And they can also, you can also sell um, food. You can have a permit for a market stand and sell the food that you grow on your, um, you know, you can most certainly share it with your neighbors as well, but you can also sell it. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of um, sharing information, this is definitely something that we've been working closely with the mayor's office in particular, but also city planning um, to elevate, you know, the importance of this work and, and have this be part of the communications process of the of, of city government as well. Um, so part of, I didn't bring it with me, but part of what, if you go to our um, food policy, Pittsburgh Food Policy Council Facebook page, we posted, uh, we had a proclamation, um, um, the mayor and uh, the county executive sign on to a proclamation for food day. Um, and the first line of it says something like, um, we understand that, um, you know, um, the health and, and well-being and, and food is the primary concern of our city and county government. So we are trying to, a variety of channels, um, raise these issues up as, as you know, something that the city needs to be a strong leader on. I don't know if that answered your question. But. It did. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Thanks, everybody, for your talk. It was really interesting. Um, I saw on your slide, Don, one of the issues was food waste, and that has had attention mostly, I think, because of that John Oliver thing that came out um, a few months ago. Um, but it is just um, staggering like how much food does just kind of get wasted either because farmers can't sell the food, it doesn't look right, so it, it, it gets, you know, in the wastebasket or groceries have to throw things out or restaurants or Americans specifically might just buy too much and end up putting it in the trash. It seems like a really complex problem, but like is there, can you talk, does anybody have anything to talk more about that problem or um, anything we can do to kind of, or, or any things communities can do to kind of rectify the amount of wasted food? Do either of you, I can speak to food waste locally, do either of you want to talk more at the industrial level or some other? Sure, I could do that. Um, should I go first or? Go for it. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think the, the food waste issue comes up often in within the um, anti-hunger sort of charitable food um, you know conversation it comes up every few years if we can just figure out this problem of food waste we can solve the problem of hunger um, not 
that that's what you're saying, and I know that in the Oliver piece he talked about that not being realistic. But um, in a lot of ways it serves as a bit of a distraction because it's trying to say that, you know, individual consumers can actually, um, by their own actions, enact enough change that will end this problem or resolve this problem. It's sort of like what you see with the environmental movement, that, you know, if I as an individual recycle, I can, you know, have an environmental impact, when really what we're talking about are systemic issues. So programs like the um, Ugly Fruits and Vegetables <coughs> campaign that France had that is actually selling the um, produce that can't go to market because it's not pretty or it's too small, um, and they're selling it at a discounted rate but at a systemic level, so it's a large amount of waste is captured. I think those are good programs. But I think we need to be cautious because a lot of times the language about waste is sort of tied into creating this secondary distribution system um, for the poor, right? So a lot like food banks are a secondary distribution system. I'm echoing. Is that annoying for you guys? <laughs> um, but anyway. So, so I think we, you know, I always take any food waste language with a grain of salt, um, and I just wanted to say that. Yeah, the, the only piece I would add is here. I mean, I, I I agree with what you're saying. You know, not not thinking. I mean, obviously, I feel badly if I throw my leftovers in the, you know, but that really isn't the scale. I wish I had data, but, you know, there's huge, massive, I mean, you've seen these tractors full of, you know, pumpkins at this time of year or whatever. Um, but we do have some efforts here to address this. We have been talking about this ugly produce thing, and that in part is a consumer um, education issue that like this tomato, even though it looks funky, tasted, it actually tastes fine. You know, there's a lot of that kind of, we just don't know our food because it comes to us in a Saran wrapped, you know, delivery system. Um, we do have um, several, our food bank does do some of this work. They do gleaning, they organize if you want to get involved and see this firsthand. Um, our farmers do plow under whole harvests of things that they either don't have the labor, don't have the market. Um, if they can't sell, you know, um, crates and crates of something, there they are, and what do we do? And we've talked a lot about that um, to create other ways to, to share that food. Um, you can also, as an individual producer, the food bank just launched a, and I don't have the, the if you, I'm sure you could come up with the search terms for this, but it's um, the, the, the food bank, if you produce something and say you have like, you know, 10 extra zucchini and you think, I don't want these to go to waste, you can take them to, to a food pantry and the, the um, the food bank has a way to, to do that. We also have 412 Food Rescue that does some of this. Um, you know, if Costco has, you know, mislabeled um, sacks of sweet potatoes or something, that's an organization driven um, by volunteers that, you know, will get that uh, food to somewhere where it will be eaten. But I definitely agree. And the first, you know, when I hear, first would hear about food waste, I, it would make me uncomfortable because we shouldn't be thinking, well, here we had this catering event and here's all the sloppy mess. Let's give it to the poor. And, you know, that's not really what we're talking about when we're talking about food waste. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, but I was thinking farming in general is probably my primary concern. But yeah, I, I could easily see that as like an insider, like fire roll kind of like, oh, here we go, especially in a cyclical fashion, as Jess mentioned. Um, thank you. So is um, food waste more of a result from overproduction? Is there some sort of like farming subsidy that's like causing that? Or what's the incentive for overproducing food. I'm looking to the two of you. I don't know if either of you have a, an answer to that. Yeah, um, I can I can um, mention a few things. Um, yeah, the U.S. is the um, uh, key case of overproduction. So we have been overproducing uh, grains and other things over the years. Um, and um, and the waste that we see in the cities, I appreciate when people are talking about food waste and uh, our personal food waste. Uh, but uh, the the food waste in the in the farms, in the industrial farms, are um, 
there is no way how you can count. There is not a, even estimates of how much we are, are losing um, before it leaves the, the field to the seeds. Um, and, and the overproduction is, is based on, uh, on the global market. Everything uh, that we produce and we're going to plant in 10 years that have already been sold in the stock market. Uh, from sugarcane to wheat uh, to soybeans, um, all those, um, uh, how much you're going to produce uh, and, the, and the commodities have been already been negotiated. So uh, for us to um, uh, control food waste and overproduction, we need to have a different set of systems. One is that the uh, agriculture should be out of the World Trade Organization. Uh, the nations should regain control over uh, food production and grains and access of uh, cultural appropriate foods. Um, and, uh, um, and I think a main another step is us also was to think about um, a better distribution of land more access to land. In the U.S., uh, in the next 20 years, um, uh, uh, about 40% or 50% of our farm land is going to switch hands because all our, our farmers are, um, are getting old. Uh, the average uh, of, uh, of the, uh, the age of farmers in the U.S. is 57 years old. Uh, and at the same time, we have about 350,000 to 400,000 people who want to go farming but don't have access to land. So I think we could certainly, um, start pro instead of producing commodities, producing food to people by increasing the number of farmers. Uh, since 1945, our, the number of farmers has been decreasing in the U.S. Now we have around 2 million people. So we have more people in jail than producing food right now. Uh, and that speaks a lot because um, in small scale farmers in farms, uh, the food waste would be much less. Um, and the food production would be regulated by uh, locally, by the food, local food economy instead of a global market. So it's not to push to uh, the answer your question to a more abstract in a abstract way calling the, the global market as the as the problem but uh, uh, there is no other way for us to address um, uh, the issue of food waste um, if we don't break the monopolies oligopolies of seed production grain production and retail and I would add a couple of things um, so I think it's at the consumer level, I think um, we do need to educate consumers. And um, human rights attorney Smita Narula talks about reducing consumption as a radical act of solidarity. And I think we need to, you know, definitely think about that. Um, and there's also a distribution issue. So, for example, Nogales, um, Arizona, which there's Nogales, Sonora, in Mexico, is the access point for the majority of our produce that comes into the U.S. in the winter time, and because at that access point they're trying to plan, you know, which produce will last for um, long enough to transport it. Um, a tremendous amount of food is wasted at that distribution point. So one of the other issues is building processing infrastructure. So, for example, I have um, a friend and colleague who runs an organization called Salvation Farms out of Vermont. And she's trying to scale up gleaning and processing across the state. So produce that, you know, it needs to be dealt with quickly. It needs to be flash frozen. It needs to be um, blanched and, and then frozen, something like that. Uh, creating infrastructure to do that so that that food will then last longer and it can be, you know, shared with food banks. It can be uh, shared with institutional kitchens and things like that. So we need to build that infrastructure. A lot of that infrastructure has eroded as we moved from local and regional food and farm economies to a more industrialized system. So I think within the U.S. it's an issue of, yeah, how we've created the, this industrial system that um, then food needs to be transported large distances and it needs to be dealt with, you know, things like that. So 
So it's a very multi-layered thing, <laughs> problem. Can I also add just the, the issue of organic waste? So at the same time, we have this, um, you know, soil depleting processes of agricultural uh, production. So if we can actually use our organic waste to create really healthy uh, compost, um, you know, healthy soil to, to refurbish, you know, our sort of exhausted soils, um, that, that could really help us go a long way. That's also a conversation we're having in Pittsburgh um, just around, you know, we don't have a composting system unless you take your stuff to AgriCycle or you have a contract with a small composting company. So we're working with the city on that. Um, and, I, and I agree with what you're saying about processing facilities. We also see, you know, as we're sort of reimagining a local food system and uh, uh, we're rebuilding it, what used to be there. So when things like, you know, all of the, the food sectors consolidated, so things like, you know, we used to have all these grocery stores, then they closed and consolidated, and now you can actually travel, you know, a couple communities over to go to the grocery store. That also happened, that consolidation happened at all levels of production. And so we see, you know, for example, here, if people want, you know, grass-fed local beef, I hear it's quite difficult because we don't actually have meat processing in our region. So it's this situation, I don't know, I just saw something last night about how we're sending chickens to China to be processed, because if what we're looking for is a lower uh, uh, labor cost, that's one thing, but if we, uh, it also creates a lot of food safety problems, but that's sort of the sidebar. But um, the, the point is that, you know, to, to have food that's grown locally, processed locally, eaten locally, which decreases the food miles and decreases the impact, you know, in terms of climate change and sustainability, all of these pieces. That's why, you know, when looking at a food system, it's very compl complex, but if you have, you know, people working on one end, talking to, to, to others working on the other end, you can come up with solutions that you may not otherwise see. Thank you. We have time for at least one more. Hi, so uh, thank you all for speaking. It's really interesting information. Um, however, as college students, I don't know about everyone else, I don't wanna speak for them, but while I'm personally very interested in this topic, it's very difficult for me to kind of like balance the logistics of budgeting and time management and making sure that what I'm doing isn't completely destroying the environment. So are there ways, like, are there good ways that aren't too expensive or roundabout or require a lot of very specific things that college students can use to get involved in this type of movement? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think uh, we have to certainly watch out for our food habits and, and the things that we are eating. Um, but many of us don't, you know, don't have the option for that. Um, and, um, and so that's an issue of justice uh, that we have to address. Um, I think things only change if we actually um, reflect and think, study, talk to each other um, and and find solutions because the solution exists and, and in our communities in our families people are developing different solutions to to those issues um, that is not a, a package solution um, but there are many solutions um, for us to to address that um, but uh, we should not see that as uh, impossible to change because uh, there is a social movement that uh, um, Don and, uh, and Jess mentioned, it's called Via Campesina International, which today is in 76 countries, uh, representing um, 250 million people who are pushing for those solutions, uh, people who actually are in the brink to be expelled from the for the land, but are the ones who are organizing and change. So, if that that can that has served, served at least for myself as an inspiration for how to change my uh, my community, my food habits, and how also how to uh, support solutions um, in my in my my town and places that I live and work. 
Um, so I think that we should all take those as inspiration and, and do our own homework in our own communities. It's not easy. It's not something that it might not change in our lifetime completely, but uh, it's something necessary to do um, if we believe in injustice. systems committee or something like that. I mentioned the Real Food Challenge before. Um, uh, you all have a great um, cook. I don't know if he's in what cafeteria. I think his name is Corey Hawk. He's very interested in local food and these questions. Um, so there is a lot of, uh, there is definitely a lot happening here, even on your own campus. And I agree just teaching um, and sharing when I was a college. Um, that's when I learned, um, you know, aside from coming from a low income family, is really where you get the chance to dig into these questions. So I'd say choose your courses wisely. One like this that gives you the opportunity to think about these things, and then you know, um, take an interest and and teach everything you learn to someone else or others around you, so that um, there's broader understanding about this uh, these challenges that we face. And can I add? And something? that is going to um, be. Oh. Oh, oh, never mind. No, very very briefly. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, one of my dreams for an integrated food and ag policy in the U.S. would be that there would be subsidized quick service restaurants that have nutritious food. Um, and I think, we, and that, you know, those exist in other places like in Brazil um, is a famous example. But I think when we start thinking of these issues, not as an issue of people who are hungry, but as a shared issue that affects all of us. So you talk about your time being squeezed as a college student. Um, income inequality affects all of us. And so that's what the human rights approach really is addressing, that this is a shared struggle and that when we segmentize and say, oh, this is a problem for low-income people or hungry people, um, that enables these things to, be, to persist as problems. But when we recognize that it's something that affects all of us, um, because it's hard for all of us who are working too much to, to um, prepare healthy meals, um, that's when we can start to build change. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise, Jessica, Salo, and Don. Let's all give them one more round of applause. <laughs> it's an honor having you with us. Thank you all for coming. Bye, guys. Thanks, Thanks again. Us. I think he just turns it down over there.